All right. Good evening, everybody, and good evening, everybody online. It's going to be a wonderful night, right, Cody? Amen. Y'all come expecting tonight? Amen. We're all going to receive. I know that. Just a few reminders that I believe everybody's aware of, but it's always good to be reminded again. For one, we have the the baskets are up front, so during the worship, just uh, be a cheerful giver and be a good steward of what the Lord has blessed you with. Amen? Amen. Tomorrow night here at the church, what goes on at 7 o'clock? Prayer. Prayer. So if you can't make it, come anyway. Amen? Amen. And uh, from 11 to 3 on Friday, what happens? Car wash. Yay. Yay. So bring your car. Get it nice and clean. Amen? 6.30, Friday night. What happens then, Cody? Youth group. Youth group. Yay. So if you're Ruth group age, please come. Amen. Then the first Friday of the month, what happens? Amen. Out at Josh's and Tina's, and that's at 6.30. And then Friday at 6.30 at Kelsey's, um, the women's group is there, the Bible study. So please come. That's wonderful. And uh, I like this. Can I read to think about it again? Think about it. Without God, man cannot. Without man, God will not. Amen? Amen. So we're going to have a wonderfully, marvelously fantastic service. It's going to be great worship and great word being read, and we're all going to receive tonight. Amen. You guys have some? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Hallelujah. God is good. Amen. Let's give God a hand. You know, there's something about praising God and thanking God. I don't think we thank him enough. Amen. I like to thank him all the time for everything. Amen. He needs to, he's a good, 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 good God. Good, 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 good father. Amen. Hallelujah. So we have some good news. Um, first of all, the drama DVD is ready now. So those of you that had asked for a DVD, um, we, I've got it with, with me. And if anybody wants to DVD, we can, you know, put your name down and make sure that I'll, I'll we'll, we'll uh, you know, get you some, okay? We've got the Blu-ray or regular. So anyway, um, the other good news is, because uh, a, a little while ago we said we need to pray because we don't have a date for the drama for next year, for 2024. Well, we do have a date. And it is actually, it's going to be a little bit different. We've never done it like this before. And it's going to be on the 22nd, which is a Friday instead of a Saturday. So we'll meet on the 23rd to actually set up and do the rehearsals, which is a Thursday. And then the Friday would be March. No. I said the 23rd. Hold on a second. I've got it written down. Thursday, 21, Friday, 22. 22. That's right. Sorry. Did I say... Oh, okay. Sorry. Okay. Correction. Say it again now. <laughs> Thursday the 21st is when we set up and practice. Friday is just like the Saturday normally where we have to, and if you all work, you're going to have to plan now to get the day off. So really, you had better start thinking about it because sometimes jobs, when you have jobs, of course, we'll announce it on Sunday and a few more times, but you're going to have to just, you know, make sure that, you know, that's something that you can do before you can sign up and say yes. What's that? March. It's in March. Yes. My goodness. Shall we start over? <laughs> what? Yes, Rick. Can I say something too? You can uh, say something. Also, when you're ordering... Blu-ray or DVD, mm -hmm. thing to remember is Blu-ray looks eight times better. Yes. Um, they have not sold DVD players in 15 years. So if you own a new TV or, and have not bought a DVD player in 15 years, or if you have bought a DVD player in the last 15 minutes, years, you actually own a Blu-ray. Yes, it's okay? really so, different. So yeah. if you own a new TV and have a DVD player that's newer than 15 years old... <laughs> Order a Blu-ray. <laughs> Blu-ray. Does that make sense? Okay. So anyway, so uh, it's March 22nd is the actual, it's a Friday. It is going to be. 
and it's a week before Easter, but it's but it's on the twenties. It's a Friday instead of a Saturday, and that sometimes may mess up a few people because of work. So we just, yeah, we couldn't, yeah, we couldn't get the Saturday, but we've got the Friday. So we're going to trust God. It's going to work out just right. Amen. And I have I. We had total peace, Dave and I, about it. Even when they we, they couldn't find us a date anywhere near um, Easter, we thought, God, this is your baby, not ours. So if you want us to do it, it's going to have to be what you know. You have to open the door. And actually, it's amazing because the people that are doing the their own performance on that Saturday, which should have been the twenty third, right? I mean, they said we're going to set up that same day because a lot of times they set up the day before. They're going to set up that same day. So actually, we were able to get in with the Friday. And he said, actually, there's somebody tentatively wanted that Thursday. But he said, I'm, I'm going to give it to you guys because, you know, we've been, he knows that that's that, the time we always do it. So, uh, you know, God is giving us favor. Amen. So let's just thank God. Father, we thank you and we praise you, Lord, that you give us such favor, Lord. We thank you, Lord. We thank you and praise you, Father, in Jesus' name. So anyway, anybody that has ordered one, I have it here. I've done all the ones that have been ordered. So if you have ordered one after the service, you can come to me and I can give you the DVD that you've ordered. Amen? If you have not ordered one, then um, you want to order one, just let me know and we'll, uh, we'll take care of it. Does that make sense? Okay. That's it. That's all I have. Thank you too, very much. And also um, in the back was the sign-up sheet for the, um, the baptism, which is June 11th. Pastor Alice has it. So if you're still contemplating and thinking about it, please sign up. And anybody online? Yeah, we've got about 20 people already. got about 20 people. So June 11th after the service here. It'll be a wonderful time. So Lord God, thank you for this wonderful evening. Thank you that we have the honor, that we have the privilege, and that we have the opportunity to come here and to fear you and have reverence for you and to honor the name that is above all names. Oh, Lord, we love you so much. Just have your way. Thank you for loving us. And we pray for the tithes and we pray for the offering tonight, Lord God. Pray for the worship for each and every one of us to just enter in in our own personal way and sing with our hearts to you tonight. And, and to be in our seats to have our hearts open to retain and receive the word tonight. We ask this in Jesus' holy, precious name. Amen. Amen, amen. I wanted to be this life it was sin. I would let my dear Savior in. Then Jesus came like a stranger in the night. Now I'm 
Hallelujah. Well, good evening, everybody. Uh, welcome to the Spokane Dream Center Wednesday service. <laughs> if you come to Sunday school, then you're familiar with me introing by saying, welcome to Spokane Dream Center Sunday school. Uh, my name is Josh Maltzberger, and I am just absolutely thrilled. I am honored. I'm blessed. I'm encouraged. And uh, that worship was uplifting and edifying and just what I needed, you know, just like rivers of living water that Christ gives us. But when we worship him and put him first in our life, boy, it just really is refreshing. So I'm going to pray, and then we're going to begin. Heavenly Father, I am so blessed. God, that I am no longer a slave to fear. I am a child of God because of the precious blood of the Lamb, because Jesus, God, you so loved me that you would willingly sacrifice your very life, be put in my place, God, be separated from the Father, endure what I deserve, God, bear my guilt and my shame. Father, I thank you for sending your Son, Jesus. Jesus, I honor and glorify you. I pray this evening. God, that today you would help us, each and every person here, Father, to fix our gaze upon you, to set aside the distractions, to recompartmentalize and reprioritize our life, God, and come to you, the source of life, the source of refreshment, the source of joy, the source of peace, the source of strength, God, you that well of living water. Oh, Lord, help us this evening in this world around us where we have such 
tendencies, God, to get mixed up and sped up and embroiled with, and we end up, God, losing our first love. Let it not be, Lord, with us. God, I pray this evening that you would bring refreshment, repentance, God, to your people, to me, Lord Jesus, in my own life, Father. Let it start with me. I thank you for this word. I thank you for your word, God. I pray that you would open up the hearts and the minds and the ears of all those here and online, Lord, whoever is going to hear this message, God, that you might minister to us through it. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So, I've had a busy last couple months in our family, in our life. I don't know if you're familiar with me. My name's Josh Maltzberger. I am the uh, older but not bigger brother of Pastor Joel Maltzberger. And um, I'm a Sunday school teacher upstairs. I'm a, I'm a husband first to my wife, Tina. I'm a father to Samuel and Joanna. We just lost a dog of ours recently. We have a new puppy that everybody, everybody in the house uh, loves real a lot. Um, uh, he's sweet. He's a good little dog. And, um, you know, my son is in baseball. My daughter is in ballet and gymnastics. We homeschool. I have a full-time job. Um, I have family that was here last weekend. I have a church family that I love. I have a men's ministry that we meet once a month. And I really look forward to. We were blessed recently with an opportunity to move out of an apartment that we were in for the last few years into a home. For the first time in four years, we're back in a home with a yard and a honeydew list. <laughs> a, pretty, a pretty big list of things to do that need to get done, that we want to get done, that we need to finance and figure out and compartmentalize, prioritize. And I have a really heavy work schedule where I'm going into inventory and inventorying a truck a day at the plumbing company that I work for and still maintaining all the other tasks that need to go on at my work. And so life is busy. It's really busy. And so when Pastor Dave asked, would you like to give the message? And he gave me plenty of time, plenty of time, more than I've had, you know, sometimes in the past. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, and I said, I would love to, because I would love to, because I absolutely love to teach and to give away my testimony. And to, I love to teach God's word. I love to study his word. But I'll tell you, in all sincerity, the last couple months, my study time has been hindered. It's been hindered because of, I'm not going to blame everything. I'm going to blame me in the midst of everything. It's very easy, even. I've got a, a loving mother, very much so. I, my mother loves me and my family, and when she know, they know our schedule, they know what we're doing, and there's times when she'll say, well, Josh, you just need to, you guys just need to get some rest. You need to just take a day off. You need to, you know, well, I'll tell you, I love, love you, Mom, and, uh, and I, sometimes you do just need a day of rest. But sometimes the issue isn't that you need a day of rest and you need separation from all of the tasks, all the responsibilities, all of the good things that you're dealing with, all of the bad things that you're up against. Sometimes we've just lost sight of our source. Sometimes we end up getting up in the morning. I still get up at the same time every morning, but it's in a new place and I'm in the word and I'm reading the word, but I'll tell you, I've been distracted. Distraction is easy to creep in when I've got 3,000 other things in my mind. Sometimes it's hard to get quiet and be still before the Lord. I want, we're going to be in Genesis 26 today. And we're going to talk about Isaac. There's not a whole lot specifically, like just a chapter dedicated to Isaac and his relationship with God. Now, you're familiar with Abraham and Isaac and Mount Moriah and, you know, and that pointing to Jesus. You're, you're familiar with some of the stories of Isaac, but this one maybe you're not as familiar with. Maybe you are, but I, I'll tell you as I sat before the Lord and asked, I mean, I even I had a conversation with Joel, and I, I felt it. I just felt, I said, it was yesterday, and we were planning something, another task that we needed to get done. And he said, well, I'm excited for tomorrow for the message. And I said, well, I am too. Because 
you know, I've been distracted and it's been hard. It's been challenging to figure out exactly what the Lord wants me to teach on and preach on. I said, but I was listening to another message actually from the church in Anacortes that I used to want to go to. And, and this is some of what he was, the pastor there was drawing out of, and it just ministered to me and it led me to go and study it out for myself. So I spent hours at night and hours this morning and hours before I came here studying this word, because I really love to study God's word. I hope you do too. I hope you take Pastor Alice's advice as on Sunday, she said, you need to read the Old Testament. Don't ever get rid of the Old Testament. You'll be surprised what you find, what the Holy Spirit shows you through the Old Testament. He'll point you to Jesus. He'll point you to your life in Jesus. And you're going to see a little bit of that in, in Genesis 26 today. But before we get started, I want to talk about one thing that I didn't know, something on Wikipedia that I looked up. Because we're going to be talking a little bit about wells. We're going to be talking about water, wells, and life, okay? And the things that a well produces. Do you realize that you're standing over a really big aquifer, like a supersized well underneath us? And I looked it up and... You know, it is the Spokane Valley Wrath Drum Prairie Aquifer. It covers 370 square miles. You know how many gallons of water are in the aquifer underneath our feet? I don't know how they figured this out. So you just got to trust the science, okay? But 10 trillion gallons of water underneath that area, this large aquifer, this large well, that natural well supplies 700,000 or more people in that area with life-giving, grass-growing, plant-growing, shower, everything you use water for. That's amazing. That's a lot of water. I can't even wrap my head around one trillion. You know, I don't know if you've ever done that. I know Pastor Dave has done that. I better get on track here, but but it's, you know, the thing is, is it's, it's, it's a big number. Trillion is a big number. If you loan somebody some money, and you, if I loaned you a hundred bucks, and I said, you know, is it okay if I pay you back in uh, a million seconds? And you said, well, sure. What, but what's that work out to? you? Oh, well, that's 32 days. And then I, and he said, okay, well, 32 days. Yeah, here's a hundred bucks. Go ahead. So, oh, no, I got my decimal wrong. And it's actually a billion seconds. And you said, oh, well, okay, what's a billion, you know, seconds? It's 32 years. So all of a sudden, it's like, well, no. <laughs> right? Just no. That's too far out. You know, I don't know. Or, or that's a lot of interest. You ready for the interest? Because 32 years. But <clears throat> then I said, okay, no, it's actually, you know what, just for the sake of fun, it was actually a trillion, you know, trillion seconds. You said, okay, well, what is it? Not not 32 days, not 32 years, 32,000 years is what that equals out to. That's incredible. 10 trillion gallons of water. So if you see a sign that says like, oh, there's a drought, then somebody's science was a little bit wrong along the way, okay? Because there is 700,000 people, 10 trillion gallons of water. We're okay in Jesus' name. Okay, so we're in Genesis chapter 26. I want to tell you something. That's the, we're talking about natural water, life-giving water. Spiritually, there's a spiritual parallel in Genesis 26 with these wells that I, I, we, we're going to get to in Jesus' name, but we're not going to start there. We're going to start in verse 1 because there's these other occurrences, this other, these other lessons. It is so rich, and so I hope to get it across in a way that encourages, edifies, and just draws you closer to the source, to Jesus. Okay, 26 verse 1. It says, And there was a famine in the land, other than the former famine that was in the days of Abraham. And Isaac went to Gerar, to Abimelech, king of the Philistines. Now, Gerar, the, if you look up the, what Gerar means, a lodging place. Gerar. So there's a lodging place that Isaac goes to. And there he meets Abimelech, king of the Philistines. Now, if you're, we're not studying all of Genesis, but if you're familiar with Genesis, then you'll know that Abraham, Isaac's father, also met with Abimelech, king of the Philistines. 
different Abimelech. Abimelech is more like a title, like Pharaoh or Caesar, right? So it's not just a name, it's a title. So don't get too confused. But he did go and see the king, Abimelech, of the Philistines. There was a famine in the land. I just want you to think about our land. I don't know about you. I know we have a prosperous nation. We have had, you know, traditionally a very blessed, prosperous nation, spiritually and physically in the, in the natural. But there are famines that happened. I don't know anything about a natural famine in our land, but I do know there's a spiritual famine that is happening in our land. That there are people even believers that are really, really thirsty. I experienced it even as we moved into this new place. And I just struck up a conversation with our new neighbors. And the wife of the husband that lives there was out gardening. And I just started talking about the Lord. And my wife had been talking with her. And we just started talking about the Lord, our testimony, the church that we go to, how we got the house, how God moved in such a supernatural way, how it was outside of us. And I mean, to the point where all, I was telling her, you know, our, about our church and the men's ministry and these things. At the end of a 30 minute conversation between my wife and me, you know what she said? They're moving in a month. She said, I wish we weren't moving. That's got nothing to do with stunning Josh or stunning Tina or stunning kids. It has everything to do with the conversation that we had that was full of the Holy Spirit that was drawing her and hopefully God willing, of course, her, her husband back into fellowship. They go, they go to a church, but they've been caught up in the nursing field, getting their education, getting their degree, trying to get the job, trying to get the house. And all of a sudden their intimacy, the life flowing waters of Christ have gotten stifled in their life. And so that conversation was a part of God, I believe, starting to dig up, starting to dig up a buried in well. Because that's what we're going to be talking about. There's these wells in Genesis. Okay, we got it. We'll get there. We're not, we're getting ahead of ourselves here. Okay. Okay. It's exciting. Not two weeks, one week. <laughs> And the Lord appeared to him. So Isaac, there's a famine in the land. Other than that famine that, that Abraham, you know, endured and went through. And this is Isaac's famine. So even though your fathers might have gone through something, you are going to go through something in your walk with God. It's just, none of us is exempt. It's not a bed of roses. There's a famine in the land in the days of Isaac. And the Lord appeared to him and said, do not go down to Egypt, live in the land of which I will tell you. Hallelujah. Thank the Lord that God appears at just the right place, at just the right time, in a time of decision, in a time of trial. Here's God, the Lord appeared. I don't know how he appeared to him, but he appeared in such a way that Isaac could understand and know who was speaking to him says, do not go down to Egypt. Live in the land of which I will tell you. He says, don't do this. Do this. God just deals with us that way. I mean, I've been teaching out of Ephesians. That's what Paul really does. He says the same thing. He says, don't live this way, but do do these things. Right? God takes us out of something, but he also brings us into something. He says, don't go to Egypt. What's Egypt representative? The world, the world system that which the world has to offer and provide. He says, don't go down to Egypt. Go to the land that I tell you. Now, this is what I love. I mean, this is providence and mercy at, at work. God appeared to Isaac to give him an, an opportunity to avoid making the same mistake as his father. If you remember Abraham and his story, one of the consequences of his time in uh, Egypt was he ended up with a Another wife, Hagar, from Egypt. And so that created all sorts of issues within the family. So Isaac also needed to learn. He learned to be obedient to God by watching his father. He learned to worship the one th true God through his father. If you consider before this, Genesis 22, right? That was the first mention of the word worship. And he says, so, but he also inherited some of his father's 
poor decision-making skills and tendencies. Some of those things that we do, it's just, this is a public service announcement to all of us, fathers, parents, mothers as well, but just all of us, our kids, we, we love our kids here at this church, and they are watching, they are observing, they are being, you know, taught through our walk, through the way that we are obedient to God, the way we worship God, the way Abraham worshiped God with Isaac. But they're also observing some of our mistakes, some of our pitfalls, some of those errors that we've made along the way. There's no condemnation in Christ Jesus. I have a list, right? I have my mistakes too with my kids. But I'm telling you, it's just understand it's not okay to just live and carry on and have a pity party and be angry and choose against God's will, right? It's not just impacting you, it's impacting others around you, specifically your children. So there's something to learn there. Now, don't go to Egypt. God says Egypt is representative of the world or the world system. God knows we won't find the water necessary to survive, or more importantly, or specifically to thrive in freedom in Egypt. He has a different plan. We sang it earlier. I'm no longer a slave to fear. I'm a child of God. See, the promised Isaac is the promised child. The promised child is destined to live in the promised land, not in Egypt. You're a child of God. God has a promised land for you. For the servants of Isaac who are digging the wells, he has servants. Isaac is a type of Christ. He has servants that are digging wells, servants that are along with him in that promised land that God has for for him and for them. He has a plan and a purpose for you. He has a promised land for you and for me, and it's not Egypt. Don't go to Egypt. Stay in the land that I tell you. Go to the land. Live in the land of which I will tell you. It says in verse 3. Before I go to verse 3, I'm just going to read some verses that tie into this, okay? Some other scriptures. Proverbs 14, 12 says, There is a way which seems right to a man and appears straight before him, but at the end of it is the way of death. God knows the end from the beginning. God knows that Our decision-making is faulty, and so there are times when we have a decision that we think is right, it might be the way to go, makes the most sense, but it appears straight before you, but the end of it is the way of death. Thank God for his mercy and his intervention to help us in our decision-making. Proverbs 3, 5 and 6, lean on, trust in, and be confident in the Lord with all your heart and mind, and do not rely on your own understanding. In all your ways, know, recognize, and acknowledge him, and he will direct and make straight and plain your paths. This is not complicated. It is plain. It is straight. It is a matter of, do you trust me? Do you trust me? Okay. Psalm 37, uh, verse 23. The steps of a good man are directed and established by the Lord when he delights in his way. I want you to be assured. I want you to know that God is no respecter of persons. As much as God has a plan for Isaac and where he would live and how he would thrive and and his progeny and everybody after him and his covenant that he has with him, God has you in his eye. God speaks to you and I directly. He intervenes in our decision-making time, in the famines of our life, and he shows us where to go, what to do. He asks, will you trust me? Will you acknowledge me in all of your ways? Will you be faithful to respond to the call that I've given you? Will you go live in the land? Will you go live in the land that I set up for you? It's not just for Isaac, it's for you, it's for me. Because you are righteous in Christ Jesus, amen? I guess it's just me, amen. The steps of the righteous are ordered by the Lord. Your steps are ordered by the Lord. He knows where you're going in life. You might not know. Isaac, before that day, he was thinking, maybe Egypt. My dad went to Egypt. I remember, maybe I go to Egypt. Until God, but God, but God intervened. Just trust in that God, the God who speaks to his people. He says, now remember, so he's going to reiterate this covenant. He says in verse 3, dwell dwell temporarily in this land, and I will be with you and will favor you with blessing. 
For to you and to your descendants, I will give all these lands and I will perform the oath, which I swore to Abraham, your father. And I will make your descendants to multiply as the stars of the heavens and will give to your posterity, all these lands, these kingdoms and be your offspring and by your offspring shall all the nations of the earth be blessed or by him bless themselves. Now he says, dwell temporarily in this land. And what I got out of this, what God was speaking to me was he was reiterating, refocusing me that everything that I have going on in my life is temporary. The land that I've been given to live in that God has positioned me to live in is temporary. Our eternal home is not here. Christ is going to make, he's going to return. He's going to make all things new. First Peter 2, verses 10 through 12. Let's go there. Sorry, I wrote most all of my scriptures down, but I did not write this one down. First Peter chapter 2, verses 10 through 12. It says, once you were not a people at all, but now you are God's people. Once you were unpitied, but now you are pitied and have received mercy. Beloved, I implore you as aliens and strangers and exiles in this world to abstain from the sensual urges, the evil desires, the passions of the flesh, your lower nature that wage war against the soul. Conduct yourselves properly honorably, righteously among the Gentiles, so that although they may slander you as evildoers, yet they may be witnessing your good need, your good deeds come to glorify God in the day of inspection when God shall look upon you wanderers as a pastor or shepherd looks over his flock. This life is temporary. This world here is temporary. The land that you're living in is important how you carry yourself in front of the Gentiles, the unbelieving world. It's important. We're going to see Abimelech, king of the Philistines, and how the Philistines interact with Isaac and his servants and his family. But we're going to see that how he carries himself impacts, affects drastically the world around him. And it's bad before it gets better. (laughs) So be encouraged. Be of good cheer. You will have tribulation in this world, but Christ overcame. He deprived it of its power to harm you. Okay, Philippians chapter 3, verse 20. Paul says, but we are citizens of the state, the commonwealth homeland, which is in heaven. And from it also, we earnestly and patiently await the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, the Messiah as Savior. And that is, For me, as I consider that and think about that and put the rest of my life in perspective to that truth, that reality, and I don't care if you're pre, mid, post, Jesus is coming back, and and we glory in that. That should give us such encouragement, such strength, and it should make all of the things that we're striving for, if we're not striving in a godly manner for godly things to show forth His glory, if it's selfish in nature, if it's worldly in nature, if it's putting the world above Christ, then it needs to be brought into perfect perspective, which when you consider Christ's return and him judging all of our works and having something to show for this amazing grace that he's given us, it helps you to put your priorities back in perspective. Amen? Okay. Dwell temporarily in the land, and I will be with you and will favor you with blessing. We're not just grinding it out here in this world. We are blessed. You are the anointed children of God, empowered to carry His message, His truth. You have Him to protect you, Him to provide for you, Him to encourage you, comfort you, teach you, lead you, guide you, direct you guide you into all truth. You're full of the Holy Spirit. You have a hope and a future that can't be cut off. You've been engrafted into the tree of life. You are a part, you're adopted as his son, as his daughter. You're a part of the body of Christ. You have brothers, sisters, small groups, men's groups, 
prayer meetings. You have fellowship with God Almighty and with one another. You are blessed beyond measure. You also have every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. You have all of eternity separated from the effects of sin in a perfect place with God. You have righteousness. You have instruction from God in how to walk righteously. I mean, you are so blessed. God's blessed you. I, yeah. Thank you, Lord. Guess what you think? When you think about blessings, the response should be thank you. <laughs> I mean, thank you. Thank you for salvation. Thank you that I'm no longer the man I used to be. Thank you for my wife. Thank you for my kids. Thank you, Lord God, for my parents, Lord, and the reconciliation that's happened there. Thank you, Lord God, for providing for me in such wonderful ways, God, that I wouldn't expect. Thank you for giving me this breath right now. Thank you for empowering me, gifting me to do something of worth, of value eternally before you. Thank you, God, for the people around me that I have the opportunity to serve and show forth the love of Christ and the servanthood of Christ. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. Okay. For to you and to your descendants, I will give all these lands and I will perform the oath which I swore to Abraham, your father. If you're familiar with the Abrahamic covenant, it has to do with the land of Canaan, the lands, the posterity, his offspring, and the blessing. And the blessing is, we know now, the Messiah himself, Jesus. He is the one at the end of verse 4 that it talks about, by your offspring shall all the nations of the earth be blessed or by him bless themselves. And in Christ, you are blessed. It says in verse 5, For Abraham listened to and obeyed my voice and kept my charge, my commands, my statutes, and my laws. Was Abraham perfect? Did he perfectly follow all of his commands? No. If you've read it, no. He did not. But he did observe. He kept his charge. He kept his commands, his statutes, his laws. Was David perfect? No. Are you perfect? No. But you know what? I'm going to continue trusting God. I'm going to continue trusting his instruction, his word, his truth, his direction in my life. I'm going to keep trusting God. Now, there is something that happens. It seems like it could have been cut off. Like that covenant, even though God, there's, there's something working together with Abraham and God. Now, that, that covenant is God, I mean, God's cutting this covenant, and he's the greater in the covenant. So God is really coming despite Abraham's inabilities, ineffectiveness on his end of the covenant. At times, God is never unfaithful to the covenant. He is willing to fulfill it to the end. And, but Isaac, you can't just run off of the covenant of your fathers and the obedience of their life. Isaac has a choice as well to be obedient in his life to respond personally to the call of God, to that uh, covenant that God produced and, and put forth before him, that he proclaims before him. He has a choice to trust it. We have a choice as well. We have pastors, we have leaders, we have, maybe you have parents or grandparents that follow the Lord. I have a, you know, a grandfather that I look up to who's passed away with the Lord. You know, I love to hear the stories about his faith, but ultimately there came a point where I had to trust Jesus. I had to have my own faith. I had to step out in faith and trust the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay. So, in verse 6. Isaac stayed in Gerar. And Gerar was what? A lodging place. So, Isaac stayed in Gerar. God honored... Um, when he reads some of my notes. God honored his oath to establish his covenant with his offspring because of Abraham's obedience. But we know he didn't obey perfectly. I already said this. Like us, yet he recognized, and because of the faith of Abraham um, <clears throat> and Isaac's faith. So this obedience, in verse 6, like his father Abraham, Isaac is obedient. He has faith like his father. I'm just, I'm thinking about my own son. I don't know about you. If you have kids or spiritual children, I want to have that type of effect and impact on my kids that if I'm Abraham, 
my son has faith, he, that he's obedient because he's learned the way I've been obedient, that he has faith because he's watched me walk in faith, and when his opportunity comes, he chooses to walk in faith. And even though I might have mistakes, and he might make some of the same mistakes that I made, that I have a God who's big enough to intervene in the midst of that child's life and show him and di- redirect him a different way. Don't go to Egypt like your dad did. Okay, in Jesus' name. So, verse 7. And the men of the place asked him about his wife, and he said, She is my sister. For he was afraid to say, She is my wife. Thinking, lest the, man of, lest the men of the place should kill me for Rebecca because she is attractive and is beautiful to look upon. Now, I mean, it's easy to just read through that. But we just went from talking about Isaac stepping out in faith on his own, apart from his dad, with instruction, meet, God appeared to him, and he says, God, you told me, go live in the land, I'm going to do it. And so we all go, hallelujah, way to go, Isaac. You chose correctly. You did the right thing. You said the right thing, and you did the right thing. And then in the next verse... The next verse. Ever, anybody's life feel like that sometime? You know? I mean, here, here I am. I'm, I'm at work. Hallelujah. I'm telling you my testimony. This, 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 and this. And the next minute, you come around the corner, and I'm grumbling about the inventory that I got to do. You know, I'm just, I'm just saying, Peter did it. What, what did Peter do? Jesus asked, you know, well, who, who do men say that I am? And they go around. Some say Elijah, you know, right? He says, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Oh, blessed are you, Simon. You know, you know, you know the story right after that. He says, Jesus says, you know, the son of man must go and be, you know, he's got to be killed. And on the Thursday, he'll rise again. He says, oh, no, 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 Lord, you can't do that. And he's getting rebuked by Jesus. Jesus is saying, no, you don't get it, Peter. You're up high. And now, oh, everybody's seeing you get brought down a little bit low. And that's what happened with Isaac. He makes a foolish, sinful mistake. Now look at what happens. The same mistake that his dad made. Go back and read the rest of Genesis, you know, the beginning part of it. He learned something from his father. I'm not, I'm not talking about like a generational curse or anything. Like that. I'm just talking about patterns, actions, way of life. You impact and influence your kids and other people. So he made a really good decision. He made a really bad decision, but God didn't disown him, didn't leave him, didn't forsake him, okay? God's bigger than your mistake and mine. Thank the Lord. Okay, so they ask him, now, it says in verse 8, when he had been there a long time, Abimelech, king of the Philistines, looked out of a window and saw Isaac caressing Rebekah, his wife. You know what it says in the King James? I've got a King James parallel. Sporting with his wife. Sporting. Like they're out there playing tennis or something. I, 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 don't, I don't know. I guess I'm just, I don't know. I don't know, King. I'm not sure. But uh, sporting. Caressing. Different versions, different interpretations of that are, uh, you know. But being intimate in a way to where he could recognize that is more than brother sister. <laughs> uh, so, so he called, you know what it's like to get, it's one thing. If pastor Dave comes to me and says, Josh, like we all got blinders, but I see this going on in your life and this is wrong. He's my pastor. I'm going to go. Thank you, Lord, for my pastor. And you know, even though it, it, your flesh might come up a little bit, like I, I trust my pastors. I, I trust them. If they come up to me and say, Josh, this is, you know, you need to think about this. This is wrong. You can receive that, right? Because we trust. That's one thing. It's another thing when the, someone from the world, someone from your workplace, who's ungodly in a pagan nation, the Philistines, comes up and says, I know more about God than you do. You can't be, in, you know, pretending here that this is your sister and then my guys are going to come and they're going to, you know, whatever, they're going to take your wife and have their way with her. And then they're going to, you're going to incur all this judgment on us. Now, how does this guy in the world, you know, that's pretty humbling to go, oh yeah, about that. 
Sorry. <laughs> but I have my reasons. Verse 9, and Abimelech, sorry. He says, and Abimelech called Isaac and said, See here, she is certainly your wife. How did you dare say to me, she is my sister? And Isaac said to him, uh, Because I thought, lest I die on account of her. I didn't want to die. I mean, he was, he was afraid. He started operating out of the flesh. He trusted God, and he operated out of the flesh. He got scared for his own skin. We do that. We still do that. And Abimelech, oh, sorry, verse 10, and Abimelech said, What is this you have done to us? One of the men might easily have laid with your wife, and you would have brought guilt and sin upon us. Then Abimelech charged all his people, He who touches this man or his wife shall surely be put to death. Verse 12, then Isaac sowed seed. Okay, so there's not much. It kind of moves directly away from that. It's pretty quiet. Because <laughs> I think Isaac was probably pretty quiet. Like, you know, he probably was like, okay, sorry, I'm going to go and just be a little more hands off in the middle of this foreign land with you foreign people that I'm kind of afraid of and I made a bad decision. But then something happens. I don't know what happened because it doesn't say what happened. But in verse 12, Isaac, it says something incredible. Then Isaac sowed seed in that land and received in the same year a hundred times as much as he had planted. And the Lord favored him with blessing. He sowed seed. Now I've got all these scriptures. I want to tie this to Mark chapter four. Okay, so I'm not going to go there, but four, chapter four, verse 18 and 19, it talks about Jesus begins all of his parables. He says, if you can understand this parable, you understand them all. Okay, so he's talking about the parable of the different soils. The sower sows the seed. The seed is the word of God. And the bird, you know, the bird comes and snacks it up, you know, snatches it up before it can take root. And then there's some that falls by the gravel and some gets choked out by the cares of the world, the deceitfulness of riches. Those are the weeds. Amen. And that's what we're going to be talking about. But there's something about soil, something about seeds, and sowing seed. The, the sower sows the seeds of the word. Now, I don't know, ex I, this is a natural example. I think it's a natural, Isaac didn't have the whole word of God. He had, he had don't go to Egypt, go over here. <laughs> so he's sowing natural seed, okay? But look at this. Look at the example. He just did what he knew to do. You know, I think a lot of time we're looking for the specific calling. You know, Pastor Dave, I know you, you teach on this often. We're looking for this specific calling. Am I going to be an apostle? Am I going to be an evangelist? Am I going to be a teacher? God, you know, am I going to be, you know, working at a nursing home? Am I going to, you know, we're looking for this specific call and God has given us a general call. He's called us all to be disciples of Jesus Christ. He's all, called us all to forgive one another. He's called us all to pattern our way of life after him as our example. He's the way, the truth, the life. He's called us all to yield and submit to him and to our heavenly father. He's called us all to go preach the gospel to every living creature, to sow seeds, to live our life in such a way that people see our good works and glorify our father in heaven. He's in, there's all these general things and we get so preoccupied and disinterested. And if we, if we haven't found the thing that we detach and stop doing what we know to do. He just went and sowed seed. And it's hard work. He did the work. Do the work of the ministry. God has predestined you to be found in him, raised to newness of life, given eternal glory in heaven. But he's called you for good works that he predestined before the foundation of the world, that you might walk in them. Isaac is giving us an example of what to do. In a land of famine, Isaac sowed seed. And God, he was trusting God, and God brought a hundredfold increase. I don't know what, I mean, I got little planters now in our backyard. I can't wait to see what happens. I mean, I'm gonna, we're going to plant the seeds, right? But I don't know what a hundredfold looks like. That sounds big. Super big, supernaturally big. Isaac sowed seed in that land and received in the same year 
a year of famine, a hundred times as much as he had planted. And the Lord favored him with blessings. Like I said earlier, you are blessed. We are blessed if we just take our eyes off of what we don't have and focus on what he has given us. Your perspective changes completely. We are blessed. And Abraham, or sorry, Isaac was blessed. And the man became great and gained more and more until he became very wealthy and distinguished. Now that's natural. In the natural, that's what happened in the land of famine where everybody else is starving. Everybody else is hurting. Everybody else is, you know, feeling pretty low. And here's Isaac, this foreigner, this guy who's hears from God. And that's why he's here. But he kind of still makes some mistakes along the way. And then here's this guy, God's blessing him. Supernatural. Like, why are his crops growing and ours, you know, no matter what we do, rough out here? What's going on with him? Now, you would think about it, and spiritually, it's the same. You know, we have been blessed in Christ. We have the fruit of the Spirit. If we're abiding in Christ, we're, we're being obedient to him. Now, all of a sudden, even though the rest of the world is falling around and there's a spiritual famine all around us, we can be an example of somebody who has spiritual richness inside of you. Richness. But the response, just understand, we're going to see a response. It's, it's, it's every example that we hear. But the light draws, you know, and it repels. Jesus talked about us, you know, being, he sent his disciples out with this good news. Teaching people to repent and to put their trust in the coming Messiah, the one who is here, put their trust in Jesus for the forgiveness of their sins. But he also told them that they would have tribulation. He said that if, the, if just know that if they hated me, they're going to hate you. See, Jesus is the well. He is the living water. And even though he has the living water, and he cried out to everybody, if anybody is thirsty, let him come and drink. The waters that he has, if you drink of him, you'll never thirst again. What an invitation. And yet, they turned him over. The Pharisees turned him over to be crucified. They hated him because of envy. See, there's a world of famine around you, a spiritual famine around us. And we have Christ. We have that well of living water. And if we're in him and we get the rest of the stuff out of the way, he can flow in us and through us. And we can have a big increase, spiritual increase in our life. Full of his joy, full of his peace, despite the things going on around us. So much so that people look at it and go, that's supernatural. I don't understand what's going on there. That's a hundredfold increase by this guy, Isaac. What's this all about? Verse 14, he owned flocks, herds, and a great supply of servants. And the Philistines envied him. It's the same feeling that those Pharisees had. And really, it's the same feeling, and you've probably felt it or experienced it in some of your conversations in Christ, even if it's a family member, it's a loved one, it's someone at your work. It's, it's almost hard, even even just someone on the street. You ever ministered to someone on the street and you're telling them your testimony and you're, I'm, you know, this is what God has done in my life. And he, and he, even though he's enviable of what's been done for you, he doesn't believe it'll happen for him. And then it creates an animosity. And he just says, just go away. That's great for you. But he's still stuck. Envied. They envied him. Now think about it, that envy can drive you to two things. You've heard people say that. You know, I remember going to uh, Alcoholics Anonymous. That was one of the only things I remember from that. Uh, but he's like, if I, you know, if you're looking for a sponsor, find somebody who has something you want, right? Go envy somebody. Go envy what they have. There's only one person, one thing 
that we should envy the living waters of Jesus Christ. That's what we should envy, that life. I want him. Now that envy can drive you to go, Isaac, what's your source? Where is this coming from? Who's this God that you serve? I want to serve that God. Or that envy can lead you to quarreling. And that's what's going to happen. We're going to see. It's no different today. Verse 15. Now all the wells which his father's servants had dug in the days of Abraham his father, the Philistines had closed and filled with earth. We're going to get them. We're going to get these guys, their crops, their, you know, they're still thinking in the natural. They're not thinking about, you know, one plants, one waters. It's God that gives the increase. This is from God. They're going, you know what we're going to do? What's a well? It's the source of the water. Without the water, there's no crops. So you know what? You're working hard. You're sowing seed, probably watering along the way. What we're going to do is we're going to fill your well with dirt, with earth. We're going to fill it up so that you can't water your crops. So their envy led them to be destructive towards this, this man and his family and his servants and his people. There's still, we still have an enemy out there. So even though they envy the blessing and the favor and everything that we have, it doesn't drive them to want to be a part of it. Sometimes it does. Praise God. Hallelujah. Keep standing. Keep, keep walking. But, but sometimes they're going to become your enemy. <laughs> this is the way the enemy works. Think about it. And I don't have a whole lot of time. But I'll, I will. Let's read a little bit. We'll get, we'll get there. Think about the earth, the dirt. They filled it up with dirt. The well is, in Proverbs, it says that guard your heart above all else, for from it flow the things of life. Your heart is like a well. That's what we're talking about. Your heart is like a well full of water. You've been saved. You've, you've tasted and seen that the Lord is good. You've received Jesus Christ. He is inside of you. You have this living water. You're the well. It's out of you. Rivers of living water flow. That's what God wants to do with the Holy Spirit in your life. What the enemy wants to do is stifle that flow of living water. He sees the blessing. He sees the favor. He sees the fruit. He's envious. He comes in with his servants. He sends his servants to come in and bury, try to bury your well. That well, dirt is coming in. What's dirt? Dirt isn't always, if, if dirt's in the right place, we just, they talk, he's living in the land, sowing seed in the dirt, and it's producing fruit. Dirt is not bad. Dirt is not heroin. Dirt is not methamphetamine. Dirt is not, those things are dirty, right? But those things are sinful. Those things are, are destructive. The dirt is just the everyday, the good things of life. See, that dirt in my planter box, if it's in its right place, I can put my hand in that soil and go, man, this is the perfect soil to plant a jalapeno plant in. And it's going to grow. This soil is good. This is good soil for that. I had some miracle grow, better soil, you know, right? If my dog runs into all that dirt after he's been swimming in our little pool, and then he comes running through my living room and jumps on my bed with a white comforter, that dirt, I am not looking at that dirt as good anymore. It is not good. That is misplaced dirt which is, oh, man, oh, what did you do that for, you dog? And he's a, he's a dog, so it's like, it's derogatory, but, but he's a dog, it's just the truth. So, but that's how it is with the life and the themes of life and the cares of the world and riches and your workplace and your, your wife and your kids and your finances and your dreams, and all the things of the world, if it's kept in its proper perspective, it's something that God wants to utilize and grow fruit from. But if it gets outside of that, and your perspective gets to where all you're doing is 
striving for those things, it's like pouring dirt on that well. God wants to dig the dirt, dig up that dirt, so that that well can actually flow freely. The thing is, when we pursue getting a new roof on the house and doing this and doing that, and all those things have to be done. I get it. I'm, I'm learning some of these things. But if we go, God, I don't need to make it to Joel's prayer on Saturday because I've got this, this, and this. And boy, if I don't get this, this, and this done, man, you know, I'm just going to have to kind of sacrifice that to do this. You understand, God. You, you blessed us with the house. So, I mean, you know I've got to do this. It just doesn't work that way. Because I can go pursue those things, but it's like adding a little bit of dirt to my well. Because I've prioritized something above him. What happens is, let's read a little bit of the scripture. We're going to get there. Verse 16, And Abimelech said to Isaac, Go away from us, for you are much mightier than we are. So the wells are filled in. The enemy wants to fill your well in. And then that enemy said, Look, you're too strong for us. Go away from us. You're much mightier than we are. And that's the response. Sometimes we get pushed away. Isaac didn't get into a confrontation with Abimelech about how he was wrong. He didn't fight for what was fair. He understood he was a man of favor, God's favor. He didn't have to fight to get the fair outcome. He was asked to leave. Remember when Jesus went across the sea um, and there was the man possessed with, with demons? And he, the gatherings, and he, he, you know, dispelled the demons. And he's sitting there in his right mind, clothed. And then all the people come, and then they go, uh, get, out, get out of here, Jesus. Okay, get out of here. That's what Abimelech said. Isaac, get out of here. It's going to happen in your life. Don't be discouraged. Keep digging wells. Okay. So Isaac went away from there and pitched his tent in the valley of Gerar and dwelt there. He didn't go far, like Spokane to Spokane Valley. You know, he just like, okay, I'll leave, but you, like, you don't have full dominion over here. I'll give you enough space to where I'm not just agitating you, but I got a life to live and God told me to live in this land. Okay. So, so Isaac went away from there and pitched his tent in the valley of Gerar and dwelt there. And Isaac dug again the wells of water, which had been dug in the days of Abraham, his father. For the Philistines had stopped them after the death of Abraham, and he gave them the names by which his father had called them. Now, so here's Isaac. Okay, I'll leave, but you know what? I'm going to keep doing what I know to do. He's sowing seed, and he's going to dig the wells they were dug in the days of Abraham. There's somebody who went before you. There's a process to dig out the wells. If the enemy has come in and put that soil, the themes of the world, the preoccupation with stuff, all of these things, and you've gotten the wrong perspective, there is a way to dig out that well. And yes, there's work involved. Yes, there's sacrifice involved. Digging a well is hard. Digging a hole is hard, right? And you could say, well, like my walk with Jesus shouldn't be hard. Well, it's, it's, it is hard if you haven't been getting up at 4.30 in the morning and you've kind of got a little bit lax and now you're getting it up at 6 and you're leaving at 6.15. Guess what? It is hard to get up at 4.30 at the beginning. But once you dig that well up, then you're just going to receive, receive those living waters. So he had an example Abraham and his men, his dad, how he read the Bible, you know, how he worshiped God for us, how my, you know, how my father prays, how my pastors teach, how my wife reads the word, how, you know, we have examples, we have other people, we have an example of throughout the ages, why is it so fun to go read a, you know, autobiography or a, or a biography on somebody who's a believer, go read about Bonhoeffer, go read about John Wesley, go read about John Bunyan, go read, you know, go read, go read about these guys. Why? Because you learned something. That's how they, that's how they dug their wells. 
That's how they made sure that they had rivers of living water flowing out of them. That's how, that's how they walked and talked and carried themselves. And you know what? I want to have a dug up well. I want to have a free flowing well in Jesus' name. So Isaac dug again the wells of water, which had been dug in the days of Abraham. I'm sorry, I'm going a little bit over, Pastor. I'll try to get maybe 10 minutes. <clears throat> so they did what they know, knew to do. They to keep digging wells. Kent, you know, uh, would say, keep chopping wood. You know, that's, I'm, my, I'm just going to say, keep digging wells. You know, it's... If, you, if it feels like work, it's a, it's a worthwhile work to get rid of that stuff. To go, no, I want it out of my life. I want God to flow freely through me. So the, the Philistines had taught them after the death of Abraham, and he gave them the names by which his father had called them. He actually honored his father and his walk and his work, right, with God. In his digging those holes, he honored his his. Uh, his father, Abraham. Now, Isaac's servants dug in the valley and found there a well of living spring water. That's the best kind of water. Not just stagnant water, not just, you know, surface water, running, living water. And of course, we could go into John chapter four, the woman at the well, you're familiar, but that's what Jesus said. That's who he is. He is the spiritual. You just keep, see, if you just keep doing what you know how to do to remove and keep digging the wells that you already have, those pre-existing wells, you keep digging, guess what you're going to find? You're going to get closer to that river of living water. The, the, the spring that's moving inside of you to Christ himself. I'm telling you, I needed to hear this message. I needed to hear it. Now, the herdsmen of Gerar, not Abimelech, the herdsmen of Gerar quarreled with Isaac's herdsmen. Are you a servant of Jesus? The servants of Isaac quarreled with the servants of Gerar. Abimelech's the king. They're the servants. We have an enemy. We are his servants. If they hated Jesus, they're going to hate us. If they kicked Isaac out of and said, get away from us, we should expect that when we have found this living water, we're going to have quarrels out there. It's going to happen. It's going to happen. And that's what it's called. So he, he, he honored his father by naming them, but he also named them based off of the experience that he had there. He named the well Essek or contention because they quarreled with him. Then his servants dug another well and they quarreled over that also. So he named it Sitna or enmity or strife. Okay, so in your walk, this is going to be a, like, it's not going to be over next Thursday. This is going to keep happening. You're going to have a while. You're going to have a season when somebody's just trying to just pour more dirt in there. Or somebody's going to come and they're going to come, come quarrel with you because of your faith. It's going to happen. But be of good cheer. He who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. He's the one that brought the increase. He's the one. He's the author and the finisher of your faith. He's your coming king. Okay. And he moved away from there. You just keep digging. Every time they quarreled, they quarreled, but you don't have to quarrel. They would just go, fi they'd go find another spot and dig a well. There's a place to take a stand for righteousness in different situations. There's a place for righteous anger. We talked about it in Sunday school. We talked about these things. But there's also a time to just endure, turn the other cheek, understand that they want to quarrel. And I don't want to quarrel. I want to keep just digging my well. I want to keep living my life in Christ. I want to keep feeding from this source in Jesus' name. And I'm not going to spend the rest of my month trying to make sure that justice is served here. God is the judge. He will bring justice in his timing. Okay. And he moved away from there and dug another well. One, two, three, three wells. And for that one, they did not quarrel. He named it Rehoboth 
or room or roominess saying for now, the Lord has made room for us and we shall be fruitful in the land. Hallelujah. All of your striving, all of your digging, whatever it takes to continue to abide in him, to feed off of him, to allow him to indwell and move in you and through you is all worth it. Because even though you have quarreling, even though you have enemies, even though you, you went from here to there, and you just, you know, pushed them off. There's going to be a time. There's going to be a place. There's going to be a promised land. There's going to be an opportunity where there's enough room for you without quarreling for God to bring blessing and fruitfulness in your life. Now he went up there from there to Beersheba. I just want to finish here. I'm going to finish here. And the Lord appeared to him the same night and said, I am the God of Abraham. He's going to reiterate his covenant. I am the God of Abraham, your father. Fear not, for I am with you and will favor you with blessings and multiply your descendants for the sake of my servant, Abraham. And Isaac built an altar there. And so there's this fruitful land. He's going to go up. He's going to go up to Beersheba, go back and read about Abraham and the covenant at at Beersheba And Isaac built an altar there and called on the name of the Lord and pitched his tent there. See, an altar is a place where we get close to God. Back in the Old Testament, there were sacrifices made at the altar. That's how you drew close close to God. He says, I'm going to draw close to you. I'm going to call on the name of the Lord. I'm going to set up my dwelling place right here with you, God. And there Isaac's servants were digging a well. Just keep digging, man. You're You're his kids. Keep digging. Then uh, um, this is encouraging. Remember Abimelech, who got, he came, then he had that weird encounter with his wife, who he said was his sister. And then Abimelech calls him out. And then Abimelech sees the fruitfulness and he says, get out of here. Get away from us. Don't give up on those that have pushed you away. Because look at what happens. Then Abimelech went to him from Gerar with Ahuza, one of his friends, and I call his army's commander. You know, he's not going to go alone. He's going to bring his big crew. And Isaac said to them, why have you come to me seeing that you hate me and have sent me away from you? They said, we saw that the Lord was certainly with you. So we said, let there be now an oath, an oath between us, carrying a curse with it to befall the one who breaks it, even between you and us. And let us make a covenant with you that you will do us no harm. Inasmuch as we have not touched you and have done to you nothing but good and have sent you away in peace, you are now the blessed or favored of the Lord. And he made them a formal dinner and they ate and drank. And they rose up early in the morning and took oaths with a curse with one another. And Isaac sent them on their way and they departed from him in peace. In peace. So there is a peace that can happen You just stay faithful. You just keep digging wells. You just keep abiding. You keep feeding off of those rivers of living water. You allow them to flow in you and through you. You get rid of the dirt in your life. The world is going to see it. And eventually, they might just come back to you. To make a covenant with you. Okay. I'm way over. Thank you for bearing with me. I just want to give an invitation to anybody tonight. I think everybody here, I don't know everybody, if everybody here is a believer. If you've never tasted, if your spiritual life is a famine and you feel it and you're always thirsty, you're always striving, you're never satisfied. You always feel like there's something missing. You feel distant from God. You've never been close to God. Maybe you rejected God. You've pursued the themes of the world and come up empty. There is one who said, Anyone who is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. That's Jesus. God sent his only begotten son, Jesus. He's the way, the truth, the life. He is the source of life. He's the light of the world. He's the author of life. He's the giver of life. He's the resurrection and the life. He's where life is found. It's where it abounds. And eternally, he's the life. We're going to be together with him. He died for your sins. He was dead and buried. He stood in your place. He endured the wrath that God should give a sinner 
like me, who's transgressed, who's done awful things, who's broken his law, who's missed the mark, who is not holy, a holy God. If I stand in front of him, that's a terrifying place to be. But I don't have to because Jesus stood in my place. He, he took my place in the cross and he took yours. If you'll just believe, if you'll trust him. So if you've never tasted of the rivers of living water, never trusted Jesus as Lord, please come up so we can pray with you. But for the rest of you, if there is any of you that has that, that the enemy has been pouring dirt, if Abimelech's men have been pouring dirt into your life and you're preoccupied and you're stifled and you don't have the rivers of living water, your relationship with Jesus needs some unplugging in Jesus' name, please come up so we can pray with you. I don't want you to leave tonight going, wow, that was a pretty good message. I want you to leave tonight yearning to get into your closet, to meet with Jesus face to face, to make him the master and Lord of your life and to pursue him above everything else. Heavenly Father, I just thank you for your word. I thank you for your people, God. I thank you, God, that you are the one who intercedes in our times, Lord, when we just need, God, a help in the land of famine, Lord, a land of dryness. And God, I just thank you that you are faithful and merciful and gracious and powerful enough to reveal yourself in those ways. And you've revealed yourself in the most powerful way in the person of your son, Jesus Christ. Lord, I thank you for this gospel message, this whole word of God. I thank you, Lord, that because you know the end from the beginning and you're the author of it, God, you can tie it all together. I pray for each and every person here that you would help them through the instruction of the Holy Spirit to sew together your word and give them an appreciation, God, for your plans and your purposes, not just for Isaac's life, but for their life and for my life, God. I just pray that uh, these words, these seeds, Lord, would hit good soil in Jesus' name and bear good fruit. We love you and honor you in Jesus' name. Amen.